Shalom and welcome. I'm your host, Chad Higgins, and I'm so glad you've chosen to join us this year for an at-home celebration of the Passover. In the past 15 years, I've had the privilege of hosting hundreds of you in live reenactments of this precious meal. However, this year has caused us to take a step back, reevaluate how we do things, and find ways we can continue to practice our faith even when we can't be face-to-face -face together. If you haven't done so yet, let me encourage you to stop this video, go back to the Highland Oaks YouTube page in the Passover playlist, and watch my Getting Ready for Passover video first, where I talk about all the things you will need to gather together to get ready to celebrate. You can also view a printable version of the checklist there as well. Next, also if you haven't done so, pause this video and go back to the Highland Oaks YouTube page in the Passover playlist and watch the video on assembling the Passover plate. Follow these steps for each person celebrating the Passover with you. Finally, make sure you have this video visible to all who are participating in your home. If it's just one person celebrating, a smartphone will work just fine. But if there are two or more, each will need to be able to see a screen to follow along and participate in the readings. In that case, a tablet or a laptop might do the trick. However, if you are able to set up close to a smart TV or one with a Roku or Apple TV box, you can either send the video from your phone to that TV via Wi-Fi or just open the YouTube app and in the search type in Highland Oaks and it will take you right to our page. If the video does not immediately show up, simply go to the playlist and look for Passover Celebration Meal. Once you've done that, now you're ready to come back to this video and begin. Shalom and welcome back. Over the years, when I've invited people, especially Christians, to celebrate the Seder with me, one of the first questions they ask is, what is that? Or why would a Christian want to do that? The Seder, or the Passover, is a Jewish ritual fraught with uniquely Jewish meanings and practices. However, Christians not wanting to know more about the Passover is like not wanting to read the Old Testament. Though it is uniquely Jewish, the Passover is filled with imagery that will not only point us to a richer understanding of the Almighty God, but we now as Christians will see its significance and a richer understanding of our own Passover lamb, Jesus Christ. Tonight, even in your homes, this is truly a wonderful celebration. We are observing God's ongoing ritual of love for His people. Together, we will share a journey from the original Passover when God saved His people from the Egyptian oppressor, delivering them from bondage. We will make the journey step by step emblem by emblem. So before we can get started actually celebrating the meal, we need to hand out some assignments. We need to identify the oldest male at each table. And if he's willing, he needs to serve as the father of that table. Now, caveat, if there's only one person celebrating this meal, you're going to read every role, and that's just fine. If there's just two people, and they're both female, or they're both male, once again, that's okay. We're making adaptions. But if you have more than three people at your table and you have a varying of ages, here are the various assignments. You also need to identify the oldest female at the table. If they are willing, they need to serve as the mother. Now identify the youngest person at the table, either male or female. They will serve as the youngest child of the table. Each of these three, the father and the mother and the youngest child, will have special parts throughout the ceremony. And finally, if there are others who are at your meal, they will just be the children of the family, and they will respond when we read words that are from all or from children, as they're indicated. So as preparation for the Passover would begin, the house would have to be cleansed of any leavened breads. Hamets, or yeast, would be anything that was made from the five major grains, wheat, rye, barley, oats, and spelt. And it's those materials that have not been completely cooked within 18 minutes from raw after first coming in contact with water. Water brings it to life and might possibly even leaven it. Now, not just yeast was cleared from the home. There were laws concerning this that were very, very strict. You cannot even keep utensils that are used for producing comets or yeast or leavening. 
they must be sold to non-Jews or even bought back after the Passover. Even pets who eat a chametz diet must be sold or the diet changed during Passover so that there is no vestige of yeast in the home. This was an activity at this point, clearing the yeast from the house, the, the leavened bread from the house, an activity for the children of the household. So if you have children uh, with you now to celebrate the meal, we're going to go to a special portion. And if you don't, you can move forward to the next part. Cleaning was the children's job, and it was for them to hunt for any leavened foods. The father would brush up the bread with a feather and a wooden spoon, and he would put it in a paper bag. The pieces would then be burned in the fireplace, and the house would then be pronounced hamitz free. So now the father of the table, or whoever is representing that, and the youngest child at the table are going to take our feather and our spoon and our paper bag. And at this time, pause the video, and the child, holding the two utensils, the feather or the two spoons, go around and pick up all of those pieces of bread that you spread around the house earlier, deposit them in the paper bag, and when you're done, just go ahead and throw those all in the fireplace. And when you get done, restart this video again, beginning the Passover. The Jewish celebration of Pesach commemorates the exodus of the Jews from the bondage of slavery. Pesach literally means to pass over. Pesach or Paschal, you've heard that word probably, also refers to the sacrificial lamb that was brought to the temple on the eve of Passover. Two-thirds of Jews routinely hold or attend a Pesach Seder. Less than half of those actually belong to a synagogue. This is a very important meal for the children of Israel even to this day. The text of the Pesach Seder is written in a book called the Haggadah. The Haggadah tells the story of the exodus from Egypt and explains some of the practices and symbol of the holiday. The Haggadah helps us gain insight into God's love for his people. Now, the Passover doesn't just happen. From the table to the clothing and the preparations, everything was purposeful. Clearing the house of leaven represents purity. The dishes were very special in that they were used only for Passover. In fact, Jews had three sets of dishes, only one that they used for meat products, only one that they used for milk products, and then the best, which would be labeled kind of the wedding china for us, would be used only for Passover. The father might even dress as a high priest in the tabernacle, bringing part of the official temple worship home for Passover. Now the Seder begins with the woman of the household, the mother, lighting the candle. She will say a blessing over the light, waving her hands as if to guide the light toward her. This gesture is a welcoming of the light of God in and to this day, a woman still invites the light into a Sabbath each Friday night and to the Passover celebration as well. Mothers, if you'll begin by taking your candle, and I want you to light it. And after the candle is lit, I want you to wave your hands over the candle as you say these words. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who has sanctified us, by the commandments, and has commanded us to reach this season. If you're the only person celebrating this meal, you can go ahead and go on to the next section. However, if you have other people at the table, they need to light their candle as well. And if they need assistance, you can help them. So pause the video right now and make sure everybody's candle is lit. And now that all the candles are lit, let's all speak these words together. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe who has sanctified us by the commandments and has commanded us to reach this season. I'm now lifting the first of the four cups that is set on the table. The first cup of juice is called the cup of sanctification. To sanctify something would be to set it apart from all the rest. The cup of sanctification was simply used to sanctify the table and all the preparations. The father would approve what the whole family had done in working to get ready for the Passover. He gives the table of blessing with a prayer over the cup. So if everyone will lift their first cup, and fathers, will you speak this blessing as we do? Blessed are you, O Lord, King of the universe, who has chosen us from among all peoples and did exalt us among all nations 
sanctified us with your commandments and with love have you given us, O Lord our God, solemn days for joy, festivals, and seasons for gladness. Everyone may now drink their first cup. The next part of the ceremony would be the washing of the hands. Normally the father washes in a basin as a reminder of the priests and their need to wash before they could go before God on behalf of Israel. What we will do, starting with the father, is take turns washing our hands and reciting a blessing to the person who is washing. The father and mother, as they each wash, will have a certain blessing over them. Then the children will have a different one. And again, if you're celebrating the meal by yourself, you'll only do this blessing once, and you can go on to the next section. At this time, hand the bowl to the person sitting next to the father and have the father hold the towel. And now, fathers, I want you to wash your hands as we all speak this blessing together to you. You will be blessed as you trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do not lean on your own understanding, but seek to know the will of the Lord in all the things you do. May the Lord make your path straight. And now you can just dry your hands on the towel. If you have a mother at your table, a separate person, let's go ahead and hand the towel to the mother and then someone next to them hold the bowl. The mothers at this time will wash and we will speak this blessing over them. Let's all say, you will be blessed as you trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do not lean on your own understanding, but seek to know the will of the Lord in all the things you do. May the Lord make your paths straight. And now the mother can dry her hands. And now if you have other people at your table, children who are identified as children at least, they will wash their hands one at a time, have them hold the towel, and someone next to them can hold the bowl. And each of them will wash their hands. If you have many people at your table, you will say this blessing several times. But you can pause it after the first one, and you can go on with the video once everybody has washed. So have the next person put their hands in and begin to wash as we all speak this blessing to the child. May you learn to understand the greatest of God's instruction, to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind. Then you will come to know true knowledge. And once we've gone around the whole table, making sure everybody has washed and dried their hands, we can move on to the next part of the meal. And now we've come to the Seder plate. After the cleansing and the washing, the Seder would focus now on this plate before us, which we've already put together. And as you've noticed, there are many items here. As we begin, we have parsley here, our bitter herbs, or carpus. Then we have a lamb bone or some other substitute that you may have on your plate. We have the horseradish, which will bring tears to our eyes a little bit later in the service. We have a hard-boiled egg with the shell still on. Then we have charosis or haroset, which is a mixture of apples, which will be the mortar for the bricks that the Israelites build. We also have matzo, two pieces on our plate that we'll use to eat these two items here. And finally, a cup of salted water. That will be tears that we dip in a little bit later. The plate represents the story of salvation, and each is symbolically representing the Exodus story. In the center of the table is a basket that we put together at the beginning of the meal. It contains what would be traditionally three folded pouches which have pieces of matzah or unleavened bread in them. The pouches or the napkins have been again divided into three pieces of unleavened bread. Now the unleavened bread represented in each of these napkins is not like bread that we think of. It's more like a large cracker. It's a flat cracker that's been marked with stripes from being grilled and pierced with holes from the cooking process. So in this part of the ceremony, the father removes this middle loaf and he takes it and he wraps it and he usually sets it under a pillow or somewhere in the house, which we'll do in just a moment. The piece will be hidden there for children if you have those celebrating the meal with you and they're going to go on a hunt for it a little bit later. But before we do that, fathers, hold that piece of bread and we're going to read this blessing. Fathers, say this. May those who are hungry and those in distress participate in the Passover. May all the people of Israel speedily come to know His fullness. Now, if you have children celebrating with you, fathers, go and hide this somewhere. That can be found, at least, in the house, and the children are going to hunt for it a little bit later in the meal. If you don't have anyone else, we'll go on to the next section.
And now we move on to what is probably one of the most quintessential parts of the Passover, and it's the four questions. As is tradition and is still carried on in Jewish homes today, the youngest child asks four questions to the father. This gives a father a chance to tell the story of the Exodus. Let's watch this video and see this song containing the four questions. Hey everybody, today we are talking about the four questions, but actually it's really the four answers to one big question. Now, traditionally, the youngest person at the Seder does the four questions, but sometimes that's impossible because the youngest person at the Seder is a baby. Sometimes, though, like me, the youngest person at the Seder is 30. Who knows? Anyways, no matter how old you are, we're going to run you through it so you can know exactly what this tradition is about. So the big question. Why is this night different from all other nights? I'm going to tell you why right now. Number one, on all other nights, we eat all kinds of bread. Garlic bread, regular bread, cheesy bread, challah bread, but tonight we only eat matzah. Number two, on all other nights, sure, we eat vegetables, but tonight we're eating bitter vegetables. Ugh. Number three, on all other nights we might dip foods once, but tonight, shtefe, I mean, we're dipping them twice. Finally, number four, on all other nights you might sit up straight, you might recline, but on this night you are reclining. Like the royals, royals. So now you know, you got the whole thing figured out, but now it's time to hear this beautiful melody. You've probably heard it before, but we'll give it a roll. We'll see what happens. Here comes number one. Shebechol halelot. Anu ochlin chametzu matza, chametzu matza. Halayla haze, halayla haze, kulo matza. Halayla haze, halayla haze, kulo matza. Number two, here we go. Shebechol halelot. Anu ochlin she ayerakot she ayerakot halayla haze halayla haze maror maror halayla haze halayla haze maror maror. Number three, here we go. Shebechol halelot en anu matbilin afilu pa'am echat. Afilu pa'am echat. Halayl haze, halayl haze, shetef amim. Halayl haze, halayl haze, shetef amim. Alright, last one, here we go. Shemechol halelot anu ochlin Ben yoshvin uvein misubin Ben yoshvin uvein misubin Halayl hazeh, halayl hazeh Kulanu misubin Halayl hazeh, halayl hazeh Kulanu misubin that, my friends, is the four questions. And now you really know that it's the four answers, but I'll keep that between you and me. Happy Pesach, y'all! The youngest child will now read the following series of questions, and the father will respond. So beginning with the youngest child, Say these words. Why is this night different from all other nights? Fathers respond. Once we were slaves in Egypt, but now we are free. We set aside this night each year to remember the great things God did for us. Youngest child. On all other nights, we may eat of leavened or unleavened bread. But on this night, why do we only eat of unleavened bread? Fathers, matzo reminds us of two things. 
We were delivered from slavery in Egypt and we have a new life. Youngest child, on all other nights, we eat whatever vegetables we want. But why on this night do we eat only bitter ones? Fathers, we remember how bitter our ancestors' slavery was in Egypt. Youngest child, on all other nights, we eat either sitting up or reclining. But why on this night do we recline? Fathers, before we were slaves, but now we are able to recline to express the rest we enjoy as free people. So as we begin to eat things on our ceremonial plate, we will begin with the parsley. If you, each one of you will take one of the sprigs of parsley or whatever substitution you have, get it ready, and we're going to dip it in the salt water at this time. The dipping of parsley into the water refers to the tears shed in slavery by the Israelites. And as everyone dips, the fathers will say these words. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who created the fruit of the soil. We remember the tears and sweat of slavery. Everyone eat your first sprig. The second sprig of parsley represents the drowning of the Egyptian army in the Red Sea and the miraculous deliverance of the nation of Israel as a result. As everyone dips their parsley, the Father will say these words. Fathers, blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who created the fruit of the soil. We remember the drowning of our foes in the waters of the sea. Please dip and eat your second sprig of parsley. Just as God drowned the enemy of the Israelites in the sea, so too has He drowned our enemy, our sinful nature, into the waters of baptism. Now we move on to the horseradish on our plate. If you will, take one of the two matzo crackers that you have. As Jews dip the matzo into the horseradish, they would think of the bitterness the Israelites endured at the hands of the Egyptians. The bitterness of this horseradish will quite literally bring tears to your eyes. They would also thank God for their deliverance to the promised land and the soil that was fruitful. So before you dip and eat, let's give thanks together as we all read this. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who created the fruit of the soil. Now let's let everybody dip their matzo in the horseradish and eat together. Now we're going to move on to the chorosis or the haroset, the apple mixture that's here on your plate, and take your other piece of matzah that's there on your plate. This mixture of apples was made to symbolize the mortar for making bricks in Egypt. The sweetness of these apples reflects sin that has been forgiven. Now, everybody's going to dip their cracker into the apples. Let's get a good piece of this because you're really going to like these apples after that horseradish. And as we do, Let's have everybody read this blessing. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who created the fruit of the tree. Let's all eat our second matzo with the apples. As you eat, it is interesting to note that the night that Jesus was observing the Passover with his disciples, he said, recorded here in John chapter 13, after he said this, Jesus was troubled in spirit and testified. Very truly, I tell you, one of you is going to betray me. His disciples stared at one another at a loss to know which of them he meant. One of them, the disciple whom Jesus loved, was reclining next to him. Simon Peter motioned to this disciple and said, Ask him which one he means. Leaning back against Jesus, he asked him, Lord, who is it? Jesus answered, It is the one to whom I will give this piece of bread when I have dipped it in the dish and then dipping the piece of bread, he gave it to Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot. And as soon as Judas took the bread, Satan entered into him. This was probably the exact point in scripture 
where Jesus was celebrating with his disciples, where he took that piece of matzah, dipped it into the apples, or fig, as we see in some translation, because they didn't have apples in that part of the country. They probably only had figs. And he gave it to Judas. That's exactly what we just observed here in the Passover. Isn't that a wonderful connection to Scripture? The next thing on our plate will be the hard-boiled egg, or the pizza. Now, take a moment at this point to go ahead and crack and remove the shell of the egg. And if someone next to you needs help, assist them. You might pause the video to do that now. Now, as you take the shell off your egg, there's no style points for getting it whole. So if some of it comes off, that's just fine. This egg reminds us of the peace offering given at the temple on the second day of Pesach, or the Passover season. It is dipped in the salt water, which also symbolizes tears. Now, in some traditions, the egg is roasted as opposed to boiled. A roasted, hard-boiled egg symbolizes the korban chagigah, the festival sacrifice, which usually a small chicken or a fowl was offered in the temple in Jerusalem. And it was roasted and eaten as part of the meal on Passover night. Although both the korban pasak, the lamb, sacrifice, and the korban Haggadah, the chicken, were both meat offerings and not eaten. The Haggadah is commemorated by this egg. The egg is also a symbol of mourning, of the destruction of the temple. And as per Jewish custom, eggs are the first thing served to mourners after a funeral. This is probably why deviled eggs are prominent at funeral luncheons. The egg is also the size of a minimal offering that someone could give if they were very poor. It is also there to remind us that life is round and it's never ending without a beginning and an end. Now Jews differ on whether to include it in the Passover meal. Some Jews like to say that the egg represents the hardness of Pharaoh's heart. Others say it represents the lamb, the symbol of life. Many Jewish scholars feel that the egg may have become part of the Seder while the Israelites were in Babylonian captivity. The Babylonians were idol worshippers, mainly that of fertility, which the egg represents. Consequently, Passover is forever connected to the week leading up to the death and the resurrection of Christ, which also may be how Easter is associated with the Easter egg. But again, this is all purely speculation. As you dip the egg in the salt water, fathers, I want you to read this blessing. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who created the fruit of the womb and grants us peace. Now you can eat as much of this egg as you want. And finally, we come to the lamb bone, or the zehora. Jews do not touch or eat this, obviously. It is considered korban pascal, or the Passover sacrifice. And items sacrificed cannot be eaten or handled. In Exodus 12, we see the story of the first Passover, when the Lord would come to destroy the firstborn male son of every family whose doorpost did not have the blood of a lamb on it. Exodus 12, 1 through 5 says this. The Lord said to Moses and Aaron in Egypt, This month is to be for you the first month, the first month of your year. Tell the whole community of Israel that on the tenth day of this month, each man is to take a lamb for his family, one for each household. If any household is too small for a whole lamb, they must share one with their nearest neighbor, having taken into account the number of people there are. You are to determine the amount of lamb needed in accordance with what each person will eat. The animals you choose must be year-old males without defect, and you may take them from the sheep or the goats. This prophecy is also for us today and that God sees the doorposts of our hearts, and likewise, eternal death passes us by. Just as the blood of the Passover lamb was needed for the Exodus, so too the blood of our sacrificial lamb, Jesus, was needed for our own deliverance from sin. Having completed all the items on our Seder plate, the focus is now to one of my personal favorites, the second cup. The second cup is used to thank God that he delivered the nation of Israel from the plagues, and it's poured with your finger onto your plate in front of you. The Father is going to name each of the plagues one by one. And as it is named, you will dip your finger into the cup 
and place one drop on a plate signifying that plague. So fathers will name the plagues as they are read. Fathers, read this together. The first plague, waters become blood. Now at this point, and after each plague, dip your finger in the cup and simply put one dot on your plate like that. For one week, God turned the waters of the Nile, the source of food and drink, into a river of blood. The fish died. The river became foul. Only the land of Goshen, where the Israelites lived, had water. Fathers read, and we dip. The second plague, frogs. Frogs were in the rivers, houses, beds, ovens, kneading bowls, everywhere, covering the land of Egypt. Yet Pharaoh still refused to let the people go. Fathers, read this. The third plague, the plague of flies. Lice, or possibly gnats even. An infestation of this pestilence rose up as dust from the ground and bit every man and beast save the Israelites. Fathers read the fourth plague, the plague of flies, or even beetles, which was the sacred emblem of the Egyptian sun god and the most honored of all Egyptian images. Ironically, this most revered and worshipped living creature invaded every pore of the Egyptian's life devouring and spoiling everything in their wake. Fathers read, The fifth plague, the livestock, diseased. Cattle, horses, donkeys, and camels all died while the herds and flocks of the families of Israel lived. Fathers read, The sixth plague, the plague of boils. Festering, painful whelps appeared on every Egyptian man and beast still living, causing immense discomfort and agony. But Pharaoh would still not believe. Fathers read, the seventh plague, the plague of hail. Thunder roared and hail fell across the fields, destroying every herb and growing thing remaining in the land until nothing fresh was left growing to eat save the Hebrews, whose harvest continued. Fathers read, The eighth plague, the plague of locusts. An army of these creatures swept over the desolation the first seven plagues had caused, devouring whatever crops were left after the hailstorm. Truly, nothing was left for the Egyptians to live on. Fathers read, The ninth plague, the plague of of darkness. A thick heavy cloud hung over the land and hid the sun so that nothing could be seen for three straight days. No Egyptian dared leave their home for fear they could not see to return. Though in the camp of the Israelites light abounded, yet not even darkness, disease, and pestilence could have prepared them for the worst act the Almighty would deliver on the nation of Egypt. Fathers read, the tenth plague, the plague of the firstborn. God told Moses, there will be one last plague and a cry in the land of Egypt, unlike any that has come. After that, Pharaoh will let you go. Moses told the people, at dusk, mark your doorposts. That night, eat unleavened bread and bitter herbs. If anything is left in the morning, burn it with fire. Then, wearing sandals, and with a staff in hand, eat in haste. God will go through the land of Egypt and kill the firstborn man and beast. The marked homes will be passed over by the angel of death. You will eat unleavened bread for seven days and observe the feast for generations to come. And just as God rescued the Israelites from the plague of death, our Deliverer came to rescue us from the plague of sin, which brings death, death that we deserve. And now, as we all lift what's left of the second cup, let's say the following blessing. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who created the fruit of the vine. And now everybody may drink from the second cup.
at this point, we're done with the Seder plate. You can go ahead and remove this from your table as we're not going to need it again for the rest of the meal. Normally, we would take a break right here and we would go ahead and actually celebrate with an actual meal that we would all eat together. If you want to do that now, fantastic. Feel free to pause this video and come back. Or if not, you can just proceed with the rest of the video. As we come now to the second part of our meal, after the formal dinner was finished, it would be time for the children to hunt for the hidden matzo bread. This is what kept the kids' interest all through the Seder meal. And the children were finally able to get up and enjoy the hunt. And when that piece of bread was found in the pouch that was hidden, it's brought back to the table where it is served actually for dessert. This is a festive procession as the children bring in the bread that was buried. Traditionally, the children were rewarded with a coconut cookie. And so at this time, if you have children who are enjoying this meal for you, send them on a hunt to find that piece of bread that you hid a little bit earlier in our time together. And then when they come back, the child who gets it, actually everybody at the table, should get one of the treats that you put down. Maybe it's one of these coconut cookies or whatever treat that you have set aside. Go ahead and share that treat together as your dessert because we're going to use that piece of found bread in just a moment. And even if you don't have children celebrating the meal with you who have just gone on this hunt, you're going to want to participate in this. We're going to teach a song to you. Actually, we're going to watch a video of Bim Bam, who's going to teach you a song that is sung in every Jewish household at Passover and probably one of the greatest memories that children have, Dayenu. Let's watch this video and make sure and participate. Hey everybody, today I want to talk about everybody's favorite song at the Seder, Dayenu. You know the one that goes, Day, Dayenu. Die, die, hey, new stop! What does it even mean? Okay, I'll tell you. It means it would have been enough. This song is all about all of these amazing things that God did for us. But even if God just did one of those things, it would have been enough. If God had just taken us out of Egypt, that would have been enough. If God had just given us the Torah, that would have been enough. If God had just given us Shabbat, that would have been enough. But God gave us all these things, Dayenu, we're so thankful. Oh my. Goodness, it's wonderful. It sounds like this. We'll start with the chorus. We just say, Die, die, Ainu. Die, die, Ainu. Die, die, Ainu. Die, die, Ainu. Die, Ainu. Die, Ainu. Sing it with me. Die, die, Ainu. Die, die, Ainu. Yeah, you got it. Die, die, Ainu. Die, Ainu. Die, Ainu. Hotzi hotzi anu hotzi anu mi mitzrayim hotzi anu mi mitzrayim die anu sing it with me now die die anu die die anu die die anu die anu die anu ilu natan natan lanu natan lanu etan torah natan lanu etan torah die got the hang of it, die, die, ain't new. That sounds good, die, die, ain't new. Die, die, ain't new. Die, ain't new, die, ain't new. Let's sing it again. Die, die, ain't new. Okay. Die, die, ain't new. Die, die, ain't new. Die, ain't new, die, ain't new. Ilu natan, natan, lanu, natan, lanu, et ha shabbat, natan, lanu, et ha shabbat, die, all right, come on, guys, sing it nice and loud. Die, die, anu. Die, die, anu. Yeah. Die, die, anu. Die, anu. Die, anu. One more time. Die, die, anu. Die, die, anu. Die, die, anu. Die, anu. Die, anu. Bum, ba, ba, da, ba, da. Oh, I didn't hear anyone. Bum, ba, ba, da, ba, da. Bum, ba. Nice job. Happy Passover, everybody. And now we come to the third cup in the Seder. And for Christians, I think this is one of the most beautiful and touchingly symbolic parts of the meal. 
Now, you remember that buried bread that we found? That piece that the father took and hid and the children went and found it and brought it back? And if you didn't have children celebrating the meal with you, it's probably still in your basket there on the table. Go ahead and pull out this middle piece. This is what is eaten with the third cup. This is the last thing that is eaten. As though eating this piece of matzo bread will sustain everyone from here on until next year. And if you've been wondering this whole time for yourself, where is it that we actually get our communion service out of the Passover meal that Jesus observes with his disciples? It's right here. This piece of bread that was found and the third cup is where the Lord would have instituted his memorial feast at the Last Supper. So fathers, take that piece of bread out of the napkin at this time and hold it up. And as you break it, I want you to speak this blessing. Fathers, blessed art thou, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who brings forth bread from the earth. At this time, fathers, I want you to take a piece of this bread, break it off, and hand it to everybody who's at your table. And of course, if you're by yourself, all you need to do is take off one piece of that cracker. Take a moment now, pause the video if you need to, to hand that cracker around. And now as we continue, fathers, I want you to read this scripture together with me. For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you, the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Everybody now take and eat your bread. And now it's time for the third cup of redemption. Redemption means to buy out of slavery. For the Jews, the lamb that was offered on the Passover was the price to deliver the nation of Israel. The third cup is what Jesus drank with his disciples after blessing and eating the hidden bread. During the third cup, Paul goes on to instruct the Corinthians by saying this, In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Fathers, speak this blessing together. Blessed art thou, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who brings forth fruit from the earth. And now, let's drink the third cup. And now we come to the fourth and last cup. And it is the cup of praise, or sometimes called Elijah's cup. Now Jesus didn't drink the fourth cup, the last cup of Seder. At the end of the Passover meal, after the third cup and his betrayal, Jesus said these words to his disciples. I tell you, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine from now on until the day when I drink it anew with you in my Father's kingdom. All the Jewish people believed, according to Malachi 3, 1 and 4, 5 through 6, that Elijah would come and prepare the way for the Messiah. And they are looking for the Messiah year after year, not recognizing that he, Jesus, has already come. And so at the end of Seder, the father asks the children the following questions, and the children traditionally respond after searching all around the house and even sometimes down the street. So fathers, read this. Is Elijah there? And all the children read. No, he is not here. Fathers read. Maybe next year, Elijah will come. For Christians, we do not aimlessly look each year for a Messiah to come and reveal himself. But we look every moment for the revealed Messiah to return again and to make us his own. So let's all raise the fourth cup. And let's say this blessing together. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who created the fruit of the vine. You may drink of your fourth and final cup. Jesus also reminds us 
that as often as we eat the bread and drink the cup, we show the death of our Savior, our Lamb, our Passover, until He comes. Those of us tonight who believe in the Lord Jesus Christ eagerly await for His return when He will take us home. Let's all say the following together. Maranatha, Lord, come quickly. And so as we close our time together, this Passover for the year, I want to speak this benediction to us. Father, the wonderful symbols of the Passover are astounding. The bitterness of the parsley and horseradish that we have eaten are like our lives before salvation. The sweetness of the apples reflects sin that has been forgiven. The salt water are as tears of repentance when we came to you, O Lord. The journey through the Red Sea is the symbolism of baptism and being delivered into the newness of life. The bread is a reminder of the body of Christ and the fruit of the vine, His blood. How beautiful is the message of deliverance. Thank you for reminding us of your unfailing love through all the ages. Thank you for showing us a glimpse of how you have woven together each moment of history to create a tapestry of your devotion and love. And thank you, Holy Father, that we can come in all confidence before you, not as slaves, but as heirs to the promise, the promise of everlasting life that comes through the blood of Christ. Father, now we are but in a wilderness of this world waiting for your arrival to take us to your promised land. One day, one day soon, our time of refreshment will come, and we thank you for that promise. Tonight, we leave revived. Tonight, we leave changed. Tonight, we leave loved. In Jesus' precious name, and let's all say together, Amen. And amen. Thank you for joining us for Passover this year. I hope even if you were by yourself in a home or maybe surrounded by many loved ones together, that this celebration brought you closer to one another and brought you closer to Jesus during this season where we focus on his passion and his death and his resurrection. Once again, I leave you in the word of peace. Shalom and be blessed.